Hello, happy Thursday. Hello. Make sure you're talking to the left. Because the left looking over hello. here. <laughs> Good morning. I am Paulina Splecta, um, birth photographer. I am Martha Lerner, doula and birth photographer and stuff with Zen Mama Love. And um, this is the Birth Talk Show, a weekly Facebook Live uh, show about all things birth and mama, mamahood and all that. Um, so today we actually have one of my very dearest friends with us on the show. Her name is Laura Connect with Good Little Sleepers. That's with three Z's, right? Three Z's. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about Laura and then I'll have you introduce yourself a little bit. So um, I met Laura maybe like about a year ago, mm -hmm. I want to say. And um, Laura is a pediatric sleep specialist. Oh, turning yeah. it down. Um, Laura is a pediatric sleep specialist and um, she's been working with a lot of my birth clients and a lot of mommies locally here and um, she works as a team with moms to identify what could be a issue that a family might be having, why their child is not sleeping, um, why their child is having a hard time falling asleep. Um, those could be a variety of issues from uh, maybe it could just be a bad routine that's not working out for the family and it's not helping the baby to calm down. Um, and yeah, so I think that that's what you do. You help, you work with parents as a team to identify these issues. You help implement a good and healthy routine. Um, and you're there to guide them along the way and provide some resources, right? Um, so please sure. tell us a little bit about what you do and what your educational background is. Sure, sure. Well, thank you guys for having me. Thank you for, for coming. coming. I'm so excited to be here. Um, so. Paulina always has a wonderful way of, of summing up what I do, but essentially that's the core of what I do is healthy sleep habits. There's a million reasons why your baby might not be sleeping well. I specifically delve into the behavioral side of that okay. and a little bit of the physical. Um, if it's medical at all, it's I refer out to everyone else. Um, Everybody I work with has to do a very in-depth questionnaire to make sure that the baby's healthy, the relationship in the household, everyone is where it needs to be for healthy sleeping habits. And this questionnaire they do before you guys work together? Yeah. Okay. Have them make sure like that everything's screening. good. Yeah. Make sure that it's a good fit um, and that it's the best case for the baby. And if it's things we can modify, that's what we do. If it's something that I say, you know, maybe we need to get talk to the pediatrician, maybe we need a GI specialist, maybe a Cairo. Okay. Let's look into other options if I'm seeing red flags that something might not be right. Okay. But it's definitely a, a tribe, it's a team mentality as most parenting things are. It's all about saying, what can we all do for the betterment of the baby and implement that. Um, so just to give you a little bit of history on me, um, I originally wanted to be a teacher, so um, I went to school for early childhood education. Um, I taught at several local schools here and uh, away. Um, and then when I came back, um, I did some programs at the Y for youth programs after school, Mommy and Me, um, swimming programs for kids and all of that. Uh, decided to take a break from that. I just wasn't loving where I was. so. Um, and then I had my son, we struggled. I realized there was just a lack of sleep information and positive guidance in that area. And I'm like, I want to help other parents. So my goal to help other parents is really to just get in there and really talk about your life, your baby, that whole thing so that we can talk about what helps you personally. Um, so I went back to get my certification. Um, there are several different sleep certifications you can get. Um, mine was in the Sleep Sense program particularly, specializing in hands-on sleep training with babies. So less so the Ferber Sears method of, you know, walking and leaving. Not to say that doesn't work for some kids, um, but that's not what I was trained in. Okay. Um, and then I have continuing education through several different associations um, that I'm certified with to continue my education and to make sure I'm up to date with uh, all things sleep, uh, whether it be uh, how the teething affects baby's sleep okay. or how a tongue tie affects baby's sleep or nutrition, um, breastfeeding, all of that. So that that's me <laughs> in a nutshell. Thanks. Awesome. That's awesome. Okay. Um, do you want to ask me some more? 
what are you saying? Oh, um, oh yeah, so when people come to you and they're in trouble, they need help with sleep, at what point are you generally seeing that? Like, when do moms usually come to you? What stage are they in when they're like, I need your help, my kid is not sleeping? Versus what stage do you feel like right. they should be coming to you? Yeah, um, so we normally get parents too late. Uh, I'm kind of the, the last straw for them. Uh, I see parents normally between coming to me at eight months and 18 months. Those are the two biggest regression points that babies go through developmentally speaking. Okay. So at eight months, they develop environmental awareness. So they're aware you're in the room. Um, and that's a big one, developmentally speaking. Um, and if your baby never learned to sleep well up until that point, that's eight months of not sleeping well. A lot of mm -hmm. moms hit their threshold at eight yeah. months. I think that was the first time I became aware that I had a problem with my daughter who's six now <laughs> was when she was eight months and I was like, let's try something now. And I was like, oh, it's too late to do anything at this point. <laughs> yeah. And then it, that, that's kind of the first big one. The first big one's four months, but they're so fresh and you're just leaving the fourth trimester. Um, so parents that had good sleepers might stop seeing good sleeping. Okay. Um, but eight months is usually where it's been too long for the moms and it's affecting their ability to mother properly and they see it in themselves that they're not being as patient with the baby. Um, and then 18 months, when you're hitting that toddler threshold, um, that's a huge regression. Um, and how are these moms feeling when they come to you at like eight and 18 months? I, I wish they'd come sooner, but normally it's, they're, they're they've hit the end of their rope they just they need to know what to do and normally it's like can we do something now right now quick fix. like i need yeah. something tonight what works right. tonight and mm -hmm. and like it's if you've gone this far we need to talk about all the other factors before we can even delve into the specific of just blanket saying oh just do this tonight and it'll fix it it's because it's not with you as i understand it's not a one size fits all kind of implementation it depends on the individual child and the individual family oh goodness yeah it, it depends on that baby that family their living style their working situation the nannies the daycares all the variable factors and i hear what they're eating oh my god nutrition are you still breastfeeding are you not breastfeeding a whole nother subject yes you can teach happy healthy sleeping habits and still breastfeed not a problem so a lot of times i work with moms on their nutrition the baby's nutrition as they cross into toddlerhood all of that comes into play and they just, they come to me too late and want a band aid mm -hmm. and say, uh, just what can I do? And I really step in and I go, it's bigger than this. If right. you've gotten to this point and you can't fix it with a little something here, or a little something there, it's bigger. Let's get, let's get dirty. Let's get into the issues and say why I ideally would love if the parents could come to me, uh, closer to the four month, if they okay. could get to me in the first three months of that baby's life, I'm not going to sleep train your baby. I'm going to teach you the best sleep habits so that your baby naturally falls into a positive sleep rhythm uh, and has a positive relationship with sleep. Instead of dreading bedtime and dreading nap time and, and it just being a constant struggle, it should be something just like breastfeeding that comes naturally and fits your lifestyle and is comfortable. Is it, is it natural for any child or are there some children who are you know, let's say they're up in the spectrum or they have other issues and are, is it more difficult for them to find a natural sleep rhythm. habit and rhythm and blah, blah, blah. Yes. I work with a lot of kids actually on the spectrum mm -hmm. because parents that are on the spectrum are getting so much input about how best to have their kid and a lot of times they're being inconsistent. So a lot of what I do is step in and offer structure and support which is so helpful for kids on the spectrum. They just, they thrive on consistency and routine and it's so important for them. Um, so sometimes guiding the parents to the best routine for that child's needs makes, takes the stress off the parents going, am I doing it right? Am I doing it right? And then it also says, you might not be on the spectrum, but you might have sensory right, issues, right. which are all things we address in the questionnaire. So we right. can talk about deep pressure, deep contact, mm -hmm. all of these other soothing methods that go into helping babies. And that's what the questionnaire helps weed out. What's your kid's personality? What's your parenting style? What are your struggles? What have you been through? And medically, if you've had issues in the first year, most likely your toddler's not going to be a good sleeper. And then you have the reflux issues. You have so many factors that affect sleep. So 
to those ends, you need to know all the pieces. And I'd love to actually, sorry, I want to interject, and that was an awesome question. Mm -hmm. I uh, was really curious about that. Do you often work with pediatricians? Do they know you? Do they recommend families to work with you? Um, yes, the pediatricians that do know me, I work pretty closely with pediatric associates, teaching okay. a free monthly class through them, sleep education class. Um, unfortunately, I'm sorry, did you say free? Free. Free. Okay. <laughs> free. I wanted to be sure I heard that right. A free okay. sleep education okay. class because I really just feel like there's just a lack of education. Is it, is it just for parents with uh, babies or pregnant Preg couples? Yeah, I get, I get at least, normally a pediatric, my class that I hold is half pregnant women and then half that are in that fourth oh, trimester awesome. phase. Okay. Um, and it's a really positive experience to just know what to expect and know how to kind of roll with the punches and best handle the situation. I love to work with pregnant moms and I always do follow-ups with them once the baby's in. Somewhere between four to eight weeks, we can start talking about saying, okay, how has how is your rhythm in the household developed, you know? Um, and it's, it's really powerful to get to moms at that point. That was brilliant. That'd be great. That'd be ideal because as a new mom, you don't know no, what it's supposed to, to look like. Yeah. You don't know what works for you because you've never done it and you don't, you know, what's not working or you, right. think, you might not even know that's not working. You might think that's normal. All, you know, all kids are like difficult at this stage and maybe it's a little not normal. What you're yeah. And a lot of times if you come to me earlier on, if you really work with me and I get into that questionnaire, we can flag signs of colic or reflux or a medical issue so much earlier or say where where is something not quite right? Even if it's not a medical issue, maybe right. I've spotted things where I've had to send people to lactation consultants or mm -hmm. chiropractors. I just had a client recently, four month old, the baby has a chronic stiff neck at four months. So they're working intensely with a chiropractor. Yes, that's going to affect their overall health just because the nervous system isn't working right, properly. Right. And had I not stepped in to see these chronic issues, they would have just continued suffering and letting their baby cry and just being like, I don't know what else to do. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, like, I think that as a first time mom for myself, I was already doing my routine with my baby wrong. And a lot of people will tell you that you can't have a newborn baby on a routine, but that's not true. In what I have just seen is because I would nurse her and then she'd fall asleep at the breast and then she'd wake up 15 minutes later when I'd unlatch her, like when she was done nursing and then I'd see she was done nursing, I'd wait 15 minutes, unlatch her, she'd wake up again crying, so I'd relatch her, nurse for another 30 minutes, and the whole cycle would continue for 18 months, Laura, I did no, this for I, 18 months, this and, I didn't, cry. and I did not realize that like one thing that I should be doing after every nursing was burping my child. I never burped her after breastfeeding because I was like, oh my god, I'm going to wake her up. Yeah, yeah. But that's just one thing that I could have incorporated among so many other things that I could have to create healthy habits. And, and just if you yeah. have that kind of community where you reach out from the get-go, it's so much easier to say, okay, maybe this isn't this isn't working for me. Like, why do we have to hit that wall before we say it's not working? Right. Like, you know what? If that intuition is telling you, I'm just really not happy, if you are not happy, talk to somebody mm -hmm. right. and say, what, what's what's the core issue? Yes. Is it your breastfeeding that's causing it? Is is it postpartum that you're just yeah. suffering from? Is it all sleep deprivation? Where is your unhappiness with the mother? And, and don't be scared to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, and we're all here, so everyone is welcome to reach out to us um, so that, you know, if you if you need help identifying what could be the issue... You can reach out to any one of us, and we've got this network of women exactly. who have a wealth of knowledge. We have all the resources, oh. and it's that's the frustrating thing because I think when you do sometimes reach out, and you've gotten to that point, and you reach out typically to a pediatrician because that's who you take your child to. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you you know you don't get pinpointed information. Right. Sometimes you don't get accurate information, or you're told this is within the realm of normal. Mm -hmm. It'll change on its own. So I think yeah, that that's, I, you know. I, that's one of the biggest ones I actually, where they go, oh, I spoke to my pediatrician, but the baby's growing fine. Exactly. So exactly. it's normal. Exactly. Well, what's your definition of normal? If it's right. not working for you, then it's not right. okay. Right. Just because it's normal for the general spectrum doesn't mean you have to settle. Yes. Right. And for me, the, the word I, the F word I hate the most is fine. Yeah. Oh, I'm fine. <laughs> I think that, I think that as women who work in the birth world and in the postpartum world are are we okay? Oh. I hope. Okay. I hope so. Yes, I think so. Okay. We'll keep going. <laughs> um, 
I, I just don't think that I'll be able to save it to my phone, but that's okay. okay. Um, yeah, I have a problem with taking pictures, if you haven't. <laughs> You're so, a but I think that um, one of our number one priorities in this, in this world surrounding mothers is to make sure that a mom is doing great. And if a mom is not doing great and she's completely burned out and she's exhausted and she feels like there's no one who can relate to her and she's starting to have complex, frequent arguments with her significant other all the time and nothing is working and there's just fighting and tension in the home, that doesn't, that's not a healthy place for that mom. She needs to have a calm environment and a lack of sleep can be a huge part of it. And it also, some parents thrive on chaos. So everything's fine with the first kid. I can co-sleep or I can, mm -hmm. you know, I have time to establish because these it's good just routines. The one kid, it's just yeah. you and the baby and you have six months before you have to go back to work. So you really get time to delve into. Oh, I wish every mom had wish. six months <laughs> before she had to go back to work. So if that were the case and you were able to take some extra time off and you, mm -hmm. it was really fine. Right. Parents call me in the second or third child. The first child was fine. They had plenty of time yeah. and it worked for them. But now baby number two is here and they don't have an hour, two hours to spend. Are you getting a lot of that. second and third time moms? For some reason I get first time moms and third time moms. Mm. Second's okay. Um, they're surviving. They're really not okay, right. but they're, you know, they're comfortable. They're yeah, they're managing. Yeah. They're surviving. Um, and then I get third time moms. Okay. They've run out of hands. They've officially cannot hold three babies <laughs> at once. They've run out of the ability to bounce between two spaces. Now they have to be in three places at once. Yeah. Just physically just taxing. Um, and then it's the constant juggle of depending on the age range. How am I supposed to meet... Uh, a child's, an elementary school kid's needs, and a toddler, and a newborn. Yeah. And I go, there's a way to balance, find balance there. It might still be chaotic, right. but that doesn't mean you can't find a routine that works for you or something that okay. works with your chaos, which is really why I step in and I say, well, what are all the other factors? Like, right. does, does, does your son need to go to hockey while your daughter goes to ballet, but you still need to breastfeed the newborn and you're trying to juggle all of that? Are you still right. pumping? How are you managing all of that? Those okay. are all the factors that go into making the and, perfect and, plan. And, and you've really given us kind of like a comprehensive look at how deeply and um, on so many different levels you talk to families about what's going on, what their situation is and their lifestyle. But I think that a very interesting question that a lot of moms probably might have is what makes your approach so different from all the sleep trainers that are out there in America who tend to have quite a negative reputation associated with them because they are um, huge fans of the classic cried out methods where you put your child in the bed, you walk away, and hours later you return to a sleeping or crying child. Um, so I'd really love to know, like, how are you so different? And I know that I have been referring to you not as a sleep trainer to any of my clients, but as a pediatric sleep specialist. Um, please tell us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what I do goes far beyond sleep just because the factors are, they're just so plentiful in that department. So, I mean, there are a lot of different strategies for getting your kids to sleep and there are a lot of positive ones and things that don't work for certain parents. And I've had people come to me that said, I worked with this other sleep consultant or I worked with another sleep trainer. And at first, when they would come to me and say that, I would be really intimidated going, oh my God, they worked with somebody else like me and they didn't see success. How could that be? Like... Can I take on whatever? And then I started to realize that there are people that are comfortable just saying, nah, just do this. It'll eventually work. And I'm like, oh, well, okay. Well, we're going to do more than that. So what really, what really hones in my skills outside of just saying, here are the confines of sleep and I'm not going to look beyond that. I look well beyond that to see what could be affecting the outside factors that affect your sleep. Um, and then... I really walk through that approach of saying, okay, what is your family like so that I can say based on your kid and your lifestyle and your factors, I can one by one create something that I believe based on this questionnaire will work for you. And about 90% of my clients see success within um, three to four days. The baby's wow. sleeping through the night. We're still working on naps. We're still fine tuning, maybe early wake ups. 
Um, and then 10% of my clients, we have to change our strategy. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. baby wasn't quite like, and so I keep my, have my parents keep a very intense log, a sleep log telling me what they're eating, what they're sleeping, all of this factors. If they're crying, what level of crying for how long are you experiencing that? What soothing strategies are you trying? What really walk through all those details mm -hmm. so I can say more definitively, this strategy is not ideal for your baby. Let's change tra tactics. Um, and normally we'll know within the first three days if we need to change our strategy and not the same strategy is going to work for every baby. But most of the time the questionnaire can really help me hone in on exactly what would work for yours, but I'm not stuck in one way. If that's not working for you, we'll find another way. Okay. And it sometimes isn't always the easiest for the parents to change strategies or to understand why they have to change. But I take my cues from the baby. How is the baby responding to this change? Because there's a level of what's comfortable for the baby. And anytime you change anything on a newborn, they're not gonna, or a child in general, you're like, oh no, we're not having that lollipop today. <laughs> they are gonna be upset with you, mm -hmm. um, but they can tell you that they're upset. And so we read all of those cues. What's their body language? What's their face? What level of crying? Most of the time moms are still in that first, fourth trimester. That's when you're supposed to be developing that relationship on crying. Is that a real cry? Is that just a fussy cry? Where are they on that spectrum of crying? Um, and really fine tuning mom's ability to say, you know what, I don't, I think he's just kind of fussing. I'm gonna see if he's okay. Um, and sometimes babies, and unfortunately, and baby, babies will cry um, throughout the process, that's just what they do. Sometimes babies cry. I know it's not comfortable to hear, but you know, I work with a lot of moms and they're just like, they come to me and the baby's crying for hours in their arms. They can't soothe the baby. So then you go, well, what's going to work for me? Like nothing's going to work. How do I help? And oh I'm like, God, I wish I knew you when Emma was born because that was her and she didn't want a comfort nurse like Kate. No. And so here I was holding a child that was crying for three or four hours my husband couldn't calm her down. Going outside didn't work. Going in the stroller. I had no idea what was going on. I still don't know to this day. So Yeah, it's, it's actually, I find those are the independent kids. Those mm -hmm. kids that really struggle with self-soothing strategies at all tend to be the babies that just cry a lot. Then you can't help them. And you're like, I just made my brain things. explode because, yes, <laughs> that is my independent kid of the two. And you'll see those personalities develop so early on. And yes. if I can help you identify your child's personality earlier on, you can help fine tune your parenting skills towards that child. So what I'm hearing, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, from what you're saying is that the way that you approach each family that you work with is, can be very different. So it's possible, for example, we work with a lot of um, moms and families who tend to be somewhere on the crunchy, natural-minded, attachment parenting, you know, maybe not. And again, there's a spectrum for all of this. So we have Always. your hardcore attachment parenters and you have the people, I do some attachment, but I'm also this. So we work with kind of a, a big spectrum of that. Yeah. Is it possible then to work with you and still respect that, you know, that attachment, some attachment parenting strategies yeah. and yeah. that side? Yeah, I feel like that's the biggest stigma that I'm always fighting, right, is you can't sleep train and be a good parent. Whoa, let's slow down. So there's no reason you can't establish healthy sleeping habits, uh, have a healthy sleep relationship, um, and baby wear, and um, room share. Um, Co-sleeping up to a certain point is totally fine in my book. I, I have nothing against it. And honestly, if what you're doing in your household is working, you're happy, your baby's happy, they're growing and all of that, that is fantastic. And you will see no judgment from me in that regard. Um, I, I'm not here to tell you how to parent. I'm just here to offer help and support for those moms that say, I, I, I tried co-sleeping, I tried you know co-nursing, I've, I've tried putting her in the bassinet, I've tried stroll, and it's just not working for me. I'm here for those parents. Um, but there's no reason, I've had lots of moms that are very much, uh, we co-slept for six months and now I, I need my sleep, it's affecting my sleep. And when you start to affect the mom's sleep, right. it affects her behavior and her and the ability whole family. <laughs> and her ability to regulate her emotions. So right. all of a sudden she's not being the patient, loving mom she wants to be. Right. And if you see that reflected in yourself, where you're going, maybe I'm not being the mom I want to be, then maybe we need to look at why. 
and say, how can we help? And so I go, you know what? It's okay. I just validate saying, you know, yeah. you're allowed to want your sleep. That does not make you a bad mom. Right. And uh, normally between six to eight months is the ideal time to move the baby into their own sleep space so that you're not super high. To, oh, they rolled. Oh, they, they burped. Oh, oh, what's going on? So you're just constantly re- attending to the child instead of really getting the sleep you need to take care of that baby. And I, and I do know a lot of families who have multiple children, so they've got anywhere from two to six children, and oftentimes they do um, co-sleep, mm-hmm. and it's working great for them. But when it's important for you to join the picture is when they are co-sleeping, or whether they're not even co-sleeping, and then they're realizing they have a problem because they're they're exhausted every single day because they're not getting any sleep. Like mine, I think was an extreme case where Kate was waking up every 15 to 45 minutes Mm -hmm. for a year and a half. She never slept longer than 45 minutes in a year and a half. That was my son. So that was literally my son, which is, he's just an independent spirit. And we had such a hard time settling him and we tried the pick up, put down, we tried rocking, we tried co-sleeping, we tried everything under the sun for my, for my particular baby. And it didn't work. And that's when I really struggled because I reached out to the community of moms right. and I got so many different answers exactly. and I didn't know which one was real. And then other people yeah. saying, oh, well, if you let him cry at all, you're going to hurt him for life. But if he doesn't cry and, and the doctor's just like, ah, he'll you're grow out of it. Oh yeah. my God. Yeah. I'm like, I can't handle to grow out of it. The yeah. quality of life isn't there. I didn't right. have my yeah. baby to say he'll eventually grow. Well, yeah, when he's 18, he'll right. grow out of it. Like yeah. that's, not, that's not what I'm in for. So that's that's why I started the company is just to be there to help support moms validate that either one what they're doing is right and they should I can fine tune what they're doing or two it's not working for them let's reestablish what works for you and say okay there's no shame in what you're doing and if Susie down the block is going to judge you because you need sleep we just don't need Susie's opinion on the subject yeah, so right. that's okay right and you have to do what's right for you so maybe you don't belong in Susie's circle maybe right, you can find right. a different circle of moms right. that have been like oh I tried that but yes. it didn't work so and it, and it is normal to find yourself I didn't know this but it, I feel like it is very normal to find yourself in this space where everyone has something that's working for them and you are lost and nothing's working for you and suddenly you feel like no none of the moms that you know can identify with your Absolutely. issues and then you Absolutely. feel like the jerk who's like right. oh why am i why am i having such a hard time yeah. everyone else has it figured out but i yeah. can't so that time. is normal and that's why we're right. here and that's why it is okay to reassess is this really my circle is this really my tribe i might want to meet some other moms who might be more supportive of what i'm going through yeah, definitely. And I, I feel like the parents that have those independent kids really struggle finding their network of moms that, yes. that understand that mm-hmm. a baby can still be a free spirit and very much does not want your baby wearing. Oh, I, He does not want I've your got, attention. I've got two polar opposites. I've got the completely high-spirited, uh, you know, like attachment child. And then I've got the very wildly independent child who I didn't know what to do with after I had done three years of co-sleeping. <laughs> so, and we just yeah. had a comment from Melissa. Thank you for commenting, saying something similar. She thought she had it figured out, and then all of a sudden she had a second, and she was like, nope. <laughs> not, not at all. So thank you for sharing that. Well, thank you so much for coming today. Um, thank you for you know being on our show. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Um, we're going to post um, Laura's uh, contact information below. If you have any questions about what she does, you can reach out to us or to her directly. Um, if you'd like to do a consultation with her to see if she might be the right fit for your family, you'll be able to have access to her contact information below. Yeah, and it's completely free, you guys. If you guys just want to talk to me and see if what you're going through is normal or if we might need to delve deeper just talk to me. If there's no cost, I just, I want to offer my services to say, if we need to do more, I'll tell you. There are times parents come to me and I just say, yeah, just here's a little tweak. Try it. And most of the time, if it's small that like me. that, it'll work. That was me. I, 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 called, tweak. I called Laura um, one night, or I don't know if I called you or I Facebook messaged you, and I was crying because I was done arguing with my three-year-old and my six-year-old. Like, if nothing was working, they were going to bed at like 11, and you gave me the shortest bit of advice, and I was like, Oh, I hadn't thought of that. And now they go to bed every night at 8 o'clock. So thank you for that. That's why I'm like, I'm not here to really make money off of you. I I just, I really want to help parents really just find their happy place and make bedtime a happy place for everybody. How much do you love your bed? I love my bed. I would like to be there right now. (laughs) Let's all go to bed.
again now, shall we? <laughs> now time. <laughs> See you next week. All right, thank you. Bye-bye.